welcome you uh, to this year's lecture by our honorary fellow uh, here at Penn Law School, our honorary fellow in residence, uh, who uh, Lisa Massimino, who is the CEO uh, and uh, of Human Rights First. Um, I'm not going to have the pleasure of uh, formally introducing uh, Elisa. That I will defer uh, to my colleague, uh, Professor Sarah Paoletti, who actually began her career uh, in, at uh, Human Rights First and really is the appropriate person uh, to, um, to uh, formally introduce Elisa. But I would, I would like to set the stage, as it were, and give you some background about this honorary um, fellow. We talk here at Penn about being sort of a leader in public interest, and everybody talks about the founding of the, what is now the Toll Public Interest Center. But if you really think about this institution's uh, commitment to public service, um, one, of the, one, uh, one of the most significant events was the creation of the uh, Honorary Fellow, which occurred in the 1950s, uh, when this was certainly not a, uh, a, a, you know, people didn't think about public service in the right way. And they, in fact, uh, 50s and, and early 60s, the uh, early first uh, honorary fellow was an, uh, uh, a young, incredibly young uh, individual uh, by the name of Ralph Nader, um, who came uh, here to Penn at that time. And the list of honorary fellows over the years um, is really a pantheon of various uh, public service uh, and public interested people over the years. The idea of the honorary fellow was originally somebody would come in and give, give a speech, but several years ago we decided that it would be far more significant to invite a major public interest figure to come in and spend time uh, here at the law school and really become part of the fabric, uh, talking to students uh, and faculty and alumni about public service and making it part of a more grand uh, week, a public service week where we, where we hold the Sparrow Conference and, and a lot of other events. And, and we, this has been, I think, a huge success over the years we've had. Uh, Stephen Bright, Nan Aaron, Joan Messing Graff, uh, and last year our alumnus uh, Marcia Greenberger, who've come in and spent a significant amount of time. And we are uh, truly delighted uh, uh, to have Elisa come in. She's already spent time teaching in classes, gave what was uh, a fascinating lecture to the faculty about um, some of the most important issues now um, before in Washington about uh, human rights and how she dealt with them. Um, it's really been, a, I think, a great week for all of us here at the law school and from everything I've heard. Today she's going to talk about the art of advocacy, uh, how you compromise and really get things done uh, in the human rights environment. Um, let me also note uh, uh, another uh, related event to her, uh, uh, to her arrival here, but in some sense is serendipitous. Uh, which is at the, at the literally on, a, on the separate trap of inviting Elisa here to serve as the honorary fellow, we also happened to um, uh, reach a partnership with Human Rights First to have a fellow, a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Law, Law School, start their career um, at, there for a year, funded um, in this case by um, the ACE uh, Foundation and one of our alumni, Robert Cusimano, the general counsel uh, of ACE. And this is really an, a, a unique partnership. I'm certainly not aware of another academic institution that in a sense has forged this type uh, of relationship which will really offer an opportunity for the next few years for a graduate of the law school to work um, at ACE, at, ACE at, um, at Human Rights First uh, and really launch a career. We have an incredibly rigorous process for the selection of this. We had a external board, advisory board uh, of alumni who interviewed candidates uh, and sent names uh, on uh, to Human Rights First. And I, I really am delighted that we have the inaugural uh, ACE uh, fellow here this year, Human Rights Fellow, uh, Kate Norland, who um, should stand up and uh, have a Um, as I said, it was an incredibly uh, rich pool. K Kate, as many of you know, has, has a strong background in refugee uh, representation 
uh, was deeply involved in trips to Jordan and, and other places and sp has speaks several Arabic languages, am I, am I correct? Um, advanced Arabic, okay. Um, so she has a deep knowledge of what's going on in the Middle East. So we really are delighted about this partnership and that will be launched uh, with Kate. I also want to recognize uh, Amy Gadsden, who um, our head of international programs here at the law school, who was truly instrumental in making all this happen, uh, in bringing together uh, ACE and the law school and f uh, conceiving of this uh, fellowship that will not only help Kate's career, but uh, future Penn Law graduates in their uh, career. Now, um, all of this really is just to welcome you and to hand it over uh, to Professor Sarah Paoletti, who, as I said, started her career at Human Rights First and, of course, leads our uh, transnational legal clinic here at the law school and is deeply involved in her career uh, in human rights issues. And I can't think of anybody better to uh, introduce this year's honorary fellow, Sarah Paoletti. Hi. Well, it really is a truly a tremendous privilege for me to be able to introduce Elisa Massimino, who has been a leader, a visionary, and a change maker, both with Human Rights First, but also more broadly within the human rights movement, since she was first hired as a staff attorney to help set up the Washington, D.C. Office of the Lawyers Committee in 1991. As Dean Fitz mentioned, I worked with Elisa at what was then the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, for two and a half years, she interviewed me shortly after I graduated from college for an internship. Now, granted, it was an unpaid internship. Uh, but fortunately, I, a position opened up shortly after I started, and I became part of the three-person Washington, D.C. office. Um, we were a satellite office to the main office in New York City. It is truly remarkable to see how Elisa has helped grow in size in reputation and in import, Human Rights First. I was in their DC offices on Tuesday while Elisa was gracing my students with her presence in my seminar, and I went to her office to participate in seminar via Skype. Um, and I have to say, while we loved our digs in the Methodist building, which was up on Capitol Hill, next to the Supreme Court, across the street from the Capitol, situated nicely between the House and Senate office buildings, which was convenient because at the time, reports and letters were all delivered by hand, usually by me, um, <laughs> uh, instead of electronically. Um, their new building now is just a few blocks away from the White House um, and is truly a, a physical manifestation, I thought, of how far the organization has come and the new heights, both literally and figuratively, um, that it has reached under Elisa's leadership. Uh, the D.C. office has gone from our family of three to 50 staff people, uh, which is remarkable. And, and, and of course, New York is still a very active and vibrant office, too. Elisa and Human Rights First have been at the forefront of a multitude of human rights issues over the, over the years. And with Elisa's leadership, first as the director of the Washington office, and now as its CEO and executive director, the organization has gained significant prominence within the policy and decision-making circles of Washington, D.C. and beyond. On issues ranging from the rights of refugees and asylum seekers, her, her first true love, human rights in Egypt and the Arab Spring, I think the last time I saw Lisa, she was saying she was all Egypt all the time. Uh, the implications of drone technology and torture and a multitude of other pressing uh, human rights-based issues. She is always strategic, as she'll talk about more today. She's very helpfully shared with my clinic students yesterday. The first question is always, what are our objectives? The second question is, how do we achieve those objectives? That approach has taken her from doing pro bono legal work representing asylum seekers in a small legal services, social services organization in Mount Pleasant in Washington, D.C., where she did pro bono representation as a uh, litigation associate at Hogan and Hartson, to Hollywood, where she's been accompanied by military generals to talk with producers of the TV show 24 as part of their campaign to combat torture. But perhaps most impressive is that throughout it all, Elisa remains tremendously accessible and giving and has served as a mentor to the countless young idealists and budding lawyers who make it through her office. 
We have been incredibly fortunate to have her here for the past few days. I know it's been a real treat for me personally, and I have heard repeatedly from students that she has spent time, that she has spent time with just how much they've gained from her interactions with them in class and individual meetings and in all the informal gatherings that she's had. I have no doubt that her presentation this afternoon will be the culmination of an incredibly enriching three days for the Penlock community. Thank you and welcome Lisa. So thanks a lot, Sarah. This has been really quite a joy for me and um, uh, although my office is freaking out just a little bit that I've been <laughs> so incommunicado for three days. It's like good for them. Um, uh, it's especially sweet for me to be here because my last interaction with, uh, with Penn Law um, was in 1984 when I uh, finally received a letter I had been waiting to receive for a long time that said, we regret to inform you that you will not be admitted to the law school. <laughs> uh, I had totally forgotten about that until the other day when I was sitting here, I thought, oh, I am at Penn Law. <laughs> uh, but it really has been a joy for me to be here, to meet all of you. It's, um, wow, what a time warp from, uh, you know, when I was in law school and the, the kinds of opportunities that, uh, that you all have here. Um, with all of the clinics and the faculty, and uh, it's really just amazing, and, and you all are amazing. I've been telling the faculty that I've been spending time with how lucky they are. Um, this is, in a way, like a mini retreat for me, somebody who spends a lot of time in a very polarized political environment where there's a ton of cynicism uh, to get, kind of uh, reflect the energy that I feel coming from all of you. Um, the idealism, the ideas, um, and the energy is really, uh, it's really great, and it's a privilege for me to be here. Um, and I really am so thrilled uh, about this burgeoning relationship that we are kicking off um, by having Kate Norland come as the first ACE uh, uh, fellow in human rights and the rule of law. I'm very, very grateful to Bob Cusmano and, and ACE uh, and Dean Fitz for making this happen, um, and Amy and Bill and everyone here uh, who supported this idea and, uh, and helped us um, bring it to fruition. It's really exciting, and we just can't wait uh, to get started on that. So um, I know looking around that a number of you have already heard me talk several times <laughs> the last few days, uh, and I don't want to repeat too much what I've uh, said before. Um, but I thought I would uh, pick up a little bit on a, a couple of things that Sarah said about, um, about our history and human rights first and how we approach issues. And then uh, I, I thought I would give you just a few tips that I've learned um, in my years of working on human rights policy in Washington. Uh, and they're very basic, um, but they, I, uh, I rely on them every single day uh, in my work. So I thought I would share them with you, and then I really hope that we can um, have a conversation, uh, which is more my favorite thing um, than lecturing. Uh, so, you know, Sarah mentioned a little bit about my history and how I got involved in this work, and uh, suffice it to say that it was um, somewhat meandering and not nearly as directed as all of you uh, with ideas, with internships in, in Geneva and, you know, spring breaks and, uh, with indigenous people in Ecuador and, uh, you know, working with UNHCR and all that you have done is so impressive. I really spent my first couple of years in private practice uh, trying to play catch up by doing all the pro bono work I can and uh, I could and learn on the job what it was like to uh, work in public interest while um, uh, logging those billable hours at my law firm. And uh, which was a challenge, but it was one that was incredibly rewarding to me because I was getting the kind of training that you get at a, a big corporate law firm. And also, you know, in the evenings, uh, as Sarah mentioned, hanging out at the Latin American Youth Center down the street from my apartment, helping Salvadoran teenagers figure out how to make a life for themselves in uh, 1980s Washington after having fled the Civil War there. Um, so, uh, 
so it was somewhat meandering, and, and my, uh, my work at Human Rights First was also 100% on the job training. Um, so everything, that, and, and I'm still doing it. I, I took on the reins uh, uh, leading the organization a few years ago, and after 20 years at the organization, pretty much everything I am doing right now is brand new for me. Um, so uh, that makes it exciting and challenging. Um, but it's really important to keep grounded and remember why we're doing all of this and what brings us in, in uh, uh, to do human rights work. And, and um, my experiences early on in using my legal training to help individual people is some of the most rewarding uh, work that I've ever done. And it's something that sustains me through an awful lot of, what can I say, that goes on on Capitol Hill. Um, uh, uh, so. Uh, so I want to just give you a few uh, kind of basic rules for the way at least Human Rights First operates in this polarized environment. And I realize that not every organization takes the same approach. Um, we are somewhat unique, uh, Human Rights First, and so maybe I should say just another word or two about that before I launch into my advice to you. Um, uh, you know, we were formed 35 years ago uh, this year, where it's our 35th anniversary, as a, a, by a group of lawyers at sort of the beginning of the human rights movement in this country, some lawyers who felt that lawyers had a special role to play in helping to build the uh, legal structures that would protect uh, human rights in the long term. So we were called the Lawyers Committee for International Human Rights, and we were technically a committee of lawyers of another organization. And over time, we became more than a committee and we became broader than lawyers and especially as we succeeded in building uh, human rights legal standards, uh, using the law to protect human rights was no longer a specialized uh, technique but one that everyone in the movement was able to use. Uh, and so ultimately we changed our name to a much um, more uh, assertive name uh, for the organization Human Rights First. Um, which at the time a lot of people worried was, you know, the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights sounds very respectable and very staid and very reasonable and uh, really who could argue with a Lawyers Committee for Human Rights? It's a very, and Human Rights First is a little bit more aggressive. It's a mission statement in a way. Um, it says something about where you think human rights belongs um, and we think uh, that it belongs at, a f at the foundation uh, of society. Um, not that it's a trump on a list of uh, important interests or rights, but that without human rights as your foundation, um, you won't be successful as a country building on uh, uh, working for the other important interests, whether they be national security um, or prosperity, economic uh, security. And so that's been our guiding force. And the way, though, that we even though our name is not, uh, the, the word lawyers and law is not in our name anymore, we're very, very much impacted by our history as a lawyers group. We tend to approach issues in a little bit of a different way. Um, we are problem solvers, I think, more than anything else. And, and we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to get to yes. That was actually, I was telling some of the students, my most, um, the most useful class that I took in law school. Sorry to the uh, professors who teach international law and human rights, but really it was negotiation, getting to yes. And I use it with my teenagers, and I use it with members of Congress and people in the White House. But that is really, uh, and that's been sort of the approach that the organization takes, trying to find common ground. So, so here are a few tips for how to operate in this uh, particularly polarized environment that we find ourselves now. Um, and they have served me well. I'll give you a few war stories about them, and then we'll have a conversation uh, about anything that you want to talk about. We, at Human Rights First, we work on so many different kinds of issues, um, and they're all, uh, in their own way, equally challenging, so I'd love to hear what you're interested in. Um, but the first uh, uh, thing that I've learned is that you have to know your audience. Who you're, if you're in the business of trying to persuade people, you really have to know who you're trying to persuade. Who are they? Why do they think what they think? Um, you know, what do they think and, and why do they think that? What motivates them? What do they care about? What do they read? Who do they look up to? Um, it's really important to understand 
who it is you're trying to convince and what motivates them. Um, without that, you really are going to be very unlikely to be able to persuade them. Of course, it goes without saying that you have to know the facts. You have to know the facts better than the people on the other side of the argument. Um, and you need to understand what their arguments are. You have to spend at least as much time standing in their shoes and understanding what their arguments are as you do your own. Um, and uh, this is in some ways a subset of that. Um, but you know, lawyers do an awful lot of talking. Um, we're trained to talk. Uh, remember how important it is to listen. If you spend too much time talking, you'll miss the opportunity to really hear the other side of the argument and you lose the capacity to recognize when you're wrong, which is going to be true some of the time. Be open to that. Um, make a point of hanging out with people who think differently uh, from you. Sometimes understanding is more important than argument. And boy, if more people would do that on Capitol Hill, we would probably be able to solve a lot more of our problems and have a bigger patch of common ground to stand on. Um, you know, when you listen to people who think differently from you, you will always learn something. Um, you might find out that you're wrong, but at least you'll learn why your opponent believes the crazy things that they believe, um, if that's how you uh, feel about it. You really cannot persuade them uh, unless you understand first. And a lot of times lawyers skip over that, and we're not really trained to, to, to do that. So that's really important. Um, when, you know, a lot of what we are doing is trying to convince governments to do the right thing, what we think is the right thing. And, um, you know, and you want that to be, you know, if you succeed, you want that change to be durable. You don't want it to be fleeting. You don't want it to be something that when somebody new is sitting in the White House, it evaporates. Um, so it's really important to look for common ground. Um, no government is a monolith, whether it's the United States government or the Chinese government. There's always somebody inside the system trying to do the right thing. Um, and you know, your job will be to figure out who that is and how to help them. Sometimes you know, uh, human rights advocates outside you know, governments are viewed as you know, their job is to you know, beat the enemy into submission. Um, and, you know, sometimes uh, that's certainly called for, um, and sometimes that strategy works and policy gets changed. But in my experience, it usually doesn't last. Um, and, and we're in this for the long haul. So it's important to think about how do you build investment in that change. Uh, and that requires looking beyond tomorrow and even beyond, you know, uh, the next year or two and certainly beyond the next election. Um, another uh, piece of advice that uh, somebody once gave me, and it, it really has proven to be true for me, is to be open to finding allies in unusual places. Um, uh, when I, uh, when, when uh, George W. Bush was first, uh, uh, shortly after he was inaugurated in the first term, um, someone who served on my board was, uh, had been in business with him. And so we got, it was my, actually after many years of working in Washington, my first time in the West Wing. Um, and we went in to see the deputy chief of staff. Uh, and it was my board chair and several very heavy hitters from my board who had various uh, things that they wanted to talk about besides Human Rights First Agenda with the deputy chief of staff in the new administration. And, and there was me, so there were four, uh, um, uh, senior men on my board were coming into the office and shaking hands with the deputy chief of staff. And then uh, when it got to me, he said, oh, I, Elisa, I know you already, I thought. He said, you gave me my first asylum case when I was an, uh, a, a second year associate at my law firm. Um, and uh, aside from the fact that it was totally awesome in front of these senior people on my board, uh, to be, uh, can, uh, to, be, to upstage them in that way. Um, what happened was later in the administration when we were struggling so much and we were disagreeing a lot with what uh, the administration was doing in lots of areas, um, one of the things that we, uh, we were looking for something concrete on which we could make progress. You know, Sarah mentioned setting clear objectives and we really wanted to find something that we could work on together. 
um, and improve people's lives. And, and the one thing that we found was this arbitrary uh, waiting period to adjust from permanent resident status for, for people who had been granted asylum and, and gotten a green card. And it and was creating this terrible hardship. Uh, and it was completely arbitrary, and we couldn't find a single person who remembered why that had been uh, created. Um, and so I went to this guy uh, who had from that point continued to uh, rise even higher in the administration and asked him for his help and uh, and we got it done we got it done very quickly and without drama why because we had a relationship but also because he had this common experience he knew what it was like for a refugee to try to navigate that system and uh, he understood uh, how important it would be uh, to make that change so you know uh, looking for uh, allies in unusual places. I didn't expect to find that uh, there, and there it was, and, um, and we built on it. Um, the other thing, and this is probably the, the hardest and in some t sometimes the most controversial uh, thing, is to um, know when to compromise. Uh, in, you know, in some quarters, and I'm afraid it's particularly true uh, in the human rights field, Compromise can be seen as kind of a dirty word. Um, you're either you know, a principled person uh, or you're a pragmatic person, but you can't be both. And, and I just completely reject that. Um, and I think it's counterproductive uh, to our overall cause of advancing human dignity. Um, but it is a really hard thing to do, and it's scary uh, to know, you know when is it that you should compromise. But I have to say, when you find yourself feeling scared and having to ask the question, should I compromise here or there, at least you know you're in the game. Because if you're standing on the sidelines and saying, I've got the good flag here, you know, come join us over here, we're the good people, um, but you're never in a position to actually move the ball, um, then you're not going to be part of the change. Um, you're just going to be on a side. Uh, and in my experience, uh, you know, when you are, it, as long as your goalposts don't change, you know, you know what your aim is. I'm not saying that we say, oh, we're no longer for realization of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. For me, that, that's my goalpost. Um, I'm, you know, I'm never going to compromise on what my aim is. But it may be that the plays we run to get through those goalposts are very uh, different. And, um, you know, the teams change up. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we got to fall back a little bit uh, in order to make progress. So um, knowing when to do that is there's no secret to it, but being, um, being open to it helps put you in the game. And that's where you want to be. Uh, so, you know, when I was a, a starting out in this field, um, I sought out people who knew how to do it and were successful. And I tried to just attach myself to them and learn from them. Uh, and it worked very well for me. And sometimes, you know, um, you know, reasonable people can differ uh, about whether you made a good call. And, and that's happened to me before. I was deeply involved in legislation to, um, uh, uh, during the Bush administration, uh, to push back on the uh, on the torture policies, and um, we had to make some trade-offs and work with some people who we disagreed with deeply on other things. Um, and there are some still in the human rights community today who think that um, we traded off too much. I actually I don't think it was a trade-off. The thing that we were working on then it was between you know treatment of detainees and um, and uh, detention issues, um, but. Uh, but we were, we were in the game and we built allies that are still strong allies for the long term. So that's really, really important. And it's the way that the change becomes more durable. Um, it's also really important to, you know, I, I think we don't do enough celebrating our victories. You know, it's, it, it's um, you don't want to get into a situation where you feel like you're devoting your life to the struggle. No one should devote their life to the struggle. They should devote their, you know, we all want to devote our lives to um, achieving results, right? To making change, to making life better, um, to making the world a better place. Um, and so when you set 
concrete objectives, as I keep, I, those of you who've heard me speak while I've been here, I've been somewhat harping on that, how important it is. I really think it's the linchpin for effective advocacy, is you have to, your starting point has to be something real in the world that you're trying to achieve. And when you achieve it, um, uh, you should celebrate. Um, but when you celebrate, you always have to keep your eye on the ball. Um, our, uh, it, it, our victories are almost always very uh, hard fought and hard won, um, but we need to make sure they stay that way. And I had this experience very early on um, in my career, almost the first few years that I was working at Human Rights First. It was during the time that the Senate began considering ratification of human rights treaties. Um, and when we were working on uh, trying to get the Senate to give its advice and consent to the um, Convention Against Torture uh, and other forms of cruel and human and degrading treatment or punishment, um, we kept running into, there was one, one problem, the, the uh, treaty required implementing legislation um, in order for, uh, for a, a state to ratify it, and that was to criminalize uh, torture in the domestic criminal law. And um, uh, the statute that kept getting proposed included the death penalty for, uh, for uh, people who commit torture where the uh, subject of the torture dies. Um, and it broke apart our coalition. Um, people we didn't want to lobby for that bill because it was expanding the death penalty. And we finally, finally got it done without, uh, with, without the death penalty. We stripped that provision out. Um, and, we, uh, and we all had a party, and we uh, got the treaty ratified with the uh, implementing legislation. There are many other problems with it that we had to deal with down the road. Um, but six months later, when nobody was looking, uh, uh, a member of Congress added an amendment um, in an unrelated bill. And if you look in uh, 18 U.S. Code, Section 2340, um, you will see uh, that the crime of torture carries the death penalty with it. Um, so keeping your eye on the ball is really, really important. Um, and last thing, and this is something we, in my, I think in our community, we're really, really bad at it. Um, and that is to remember to say thank you to your allies. Um, whether it's members of Congress, they really like to be thanked. It's really, really important. Um, but also the executive branch. Uh, um, people, you know, write them a letter, give them an award, recognize their leadership. You know, when you're celebrating a victory, make sure to include them. Um, and even small victories. You know, political leadership is very rare. Um, real, you know, there are not a lot of profiles in courage in government these days, in my view, and um, and sometimes it, it you know, um, our political leaders find it very, very difficult to stand up and do the right thing, and when they do, they deserve a lot of support. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, write them a letter, invite them to speak, um, track them down, go to their office and just say, I'm here for one reason, and that's to say thank you for your leadership on this. Um, and that um, will help create allies for the long term because undoubtedly you will need them again um, and they'll remember it. So um, those are my tips and, uh, and I have lots more to say about um, those of you who have heard me talk already. Also, I've been harping a lot on effective writing and how to write to persuade. I'm happy to talk more about that if you want, um, but I'd also love to talk about all of the issues that we are that all of you are working on, that Human Rights First is working on, and anything else you want to talk about. Um, you've heard a little bit about my story and how I got here, but if you want to talk more about career paths and all of that, I'm happy to do that. So I'll stop talking now and take whatever questions or comments any of you might have. Yes? Well, on the last part, because I know there are a lot of people who think that you should boycott the movie, um, I just feel like if you're going to engage, uh, and I was seeking very actively to engage with the filmmakers, that you have to see it in order to do that. Um, 
So, uh, and to be able to talk to people about the movie, you know, seeing it is important. Um, uh, but, and so your question was more about, uh, did I get to? Okay, right. So, so we knew that this movie was in the works for a while, and we knew the original. Um, how many of you have seen Zero Dark Thirty? You're law students. You don't go to the movies, right? Yeah. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Zero Dark Thirty did not win. It won one uh, one Oscar for sound editing or something like that, but it did not. Thankfully, uh, did not win. Although what we were trying to make happen was if anybody prominent want, was standing up. Um, you know, receiving an Academy Award for the film, we wanted them um, to uh, uh, say um, that the Americans who want the real story should not rely on Hollywood. They should get the Senate Intelligence Committee report on the torture program uh, declassified and released publicly. That's my current obsession, is to make that happen. Um, I wrote to Kit Bigelow. Uh, we had somewhat of a back and forth with Mark Boll, who was the writer for the movie. Um, uh, she did not, I've tried to reach Jessica Chastain, somebody else who I thought had maybe a shot of being, you know, standing up on the, on the stage for the Academy Awards. None of that happened. Um, uh, so I didn't speak with them. Um, the, you know, I think part of the reason they may have been reluctant is that, um, you know, uh, f for those of you who didn't follow this, so the, 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 the uh, filmmakers uh, got access, you know, they, as is not totally uncommon for Hollywood and government to collaborate in some way, and so they met with the CIA um, and got information, not classified, I assume, uh, information that helped in the research and writing of the film, particularly what people say anyway is the final the, the final scene, the you know the um, bin Laden operation was strikingly accurate, um, uh, and so you know in the lead up to the release of the film, actually the um, the filmmakers I think were anticipating attacks from the right because it was remember it was going to come out before the election. And there was a, a um, concern uh, in, uh, amongst many Republicans that this was kind of going to be used as an Obama propaganda tool before the election, that they had, you know, worked with the filmmakers to, um, you know, that because they thought the film would be helpful to Democrats in the election. Uh, and so I think they were somewhat blindsided by, uh, you know, because my, my own interpretation is that the CIA fend you know, fed them a line that was not completely accurate about uh, torture and its relationship to um, to the bin Laden operation, and and they honestly thought that that's you know exactly how it happened. So they didn't think there would be much backlash. I think they were somewhat surprised. And then when Senator uh, Feinstein and Levin and McCain um, from the Intelligence Committee. Um, uh, you know, wrote a letter saying we want to know, you know, we reject the premise of this film, we've seen information to the contrary, and we want to know more. They used that as a way to deflect this entire debate and make it about free speech and, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, how, you know, don't attack us, Congress, we're, we're filmmakers, you know, we're artists, and um, which I'm somewhat sympathetic to, except the film opens with a um, with words on the on the opening um, screen that says, uh, based on um, uh, a record of actual events, and so it's trying to have it both ways. And um, you know, for those of us who work on torture uh, and are working really hard to get the true story out, you know. Most Americans are going to watch Zero Dark Thirty and not read a 6,000-page Senate Intelligence Committee report. So the power of popular culture is really, I mean, it's, it's, you, you cannot overstate that. Um, so it's, I think, was really damaging. And, you know, sure enough, uh, at the American Enterprise Institute, a conservative think tank in Washington, they had a panel uh, after the film came out, you know, saying, this is, you know, see, this proves we were right. Um, that torture was led us to bin Laden, and um, the fact that the president has put those techniques aside is making us less safe. Um, and uh, and it was a 
completely one-sided panel. Now, I, I, was, I spoke on a panel at the American Enterprise Institute right after the bin Laden operation when this kind of bubbled up and there was this assertion by um, people from the previous administration that, you know, this would never have happened without torture. You know, I kind of shamed them into inviting me. Um, and um, I think it's really important just as a, you know, I will add that to my advocacy tips. Go into the lion's den. Don't say I'm above Fox News or I won't, you know, discuss this with Hannity and, you know, no. You have to go in there and talk. And it, I don't think it lends legitimacy to them. I think that it, you know, y y they live in a bubble. And, um, and, and so does the other side, frankly, a lot of the times. And, you know, you just have to mix it up. It's really, really important to have a good conversation about these things. So, um, but it, it's, it's really a big challenge. I mean, trying to swim against the tide, um, you know, I can t say as a mother of three teenagers, uh, the tide of popular culture is really challenging. Um, and, you know, to think that a, you know, a small nonprofit is going to be able to take that on alone is pretty um, daunting. Um, but, uh, as Sarah said, we, we tried it. Um, we tried it. We, got, went to, we, we took the um, Commandant of West Point to the set of 24, w which was a hit show um, about five years ago. Um, uh, that was like a one-hour advertisement for torture that was watched by 15 million Americans every week uh, and challenged the writers and producers to think about what they were doing, not only to think about the revenge fantasies that it was fostering in our country, but to understand that, um, that 24 was being exported and was, uh, you know, it was not only the most popular show in Congress, but it was also being watched by a lot of people um, in the Middle East and they were getting their views about what America stands for from that show. Now, I'm all about, you know, the First Amendment and free speech, and I never would want to censor that show. But I did want the writers and producers to understand the possible impact of what they were doing. And some of them were pretty shocked by it, and so shocked that they agreed to cooperate with us in creating a documentary called Primetime Torture that we then... Um, um, produced and uh, put into 150 military academic institutions to try to make sure that young uh, cadets understood that this was not consistent with the laws of war and it was counterproductive from a national security standpoint. Do you still have a question? <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I guess in s since part of our goal at Human Rights First is to break that apart um, and to decrease the polarization around human rights issues and to remind Americans across the political spectrum that human rights is essential to our national identity and that it's a strong national interest that, you know, uh, um, you know, I think that we've made some real progress in that area. So, you know, I think in some ways we're, you know, we're demonstrating that, um, you know, more Republicans today will be comfortable saying the words human rights uh, than they were t um, eight years ago, ten years ago, I think. But, you know, if you look farther back, you know, when Amnesty International was getting started, um, you know, primary supporters of Amnesty International in the United States, there were prominent Republicans who were supporting Amnesty International. That is not the case now. Now, that might say something about the direction of Amnesty International um, as much as it does about, you know, the polarization in our country. But, um, you know, what we're aiming for is to, uh, you know, to make the, uh, the argument that human rights is not partisan issue. It didn't start out that way. Um, you know, the founders of our country believed in these values, and uh, they're universal. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're part of our uh, national identity, but they're also, uh, 
universal. And I think that's gaining some traction. I really do. Um, some of the rising stars in the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are, um, you know, staking out a place on some human rights issues. Um, and it's even causing some of them to work together. Um, I wrote a, an op-ed, I had an op-ed in a Texas uh, newspaper in the Houston Chronicle last year praising John Cornyn, um, who I don't agree with on a lot of things, but he crossed party lines and helped us uh, put pressure on the Pentagon uh, to um, end its contracts with the Russian state arms dealer, Rosa Bourne Export, who was supplying um, uh, arms to the Assad regime in Syria. And we thought, you know, the U.S. shouldn't be dealing with with the uh, with that arms dealer, uh, even if it's for important parts for helicopters in Afghanistan. We can find them someplace else. And so I praised him for doing that, for his leadership in doing that. And he was willing. In this was, I think, right before the election again. So it was an incredibly polarized moment in Congress. There wasn't much going on bipartisan, but they did that. So you know, I'm. It's sort of an occupational hazard to be a glass half full kind of gal if you're in this business. Um, but I do think that we're making progress. And so, you know, part of the strategy, if that's one of your goals, is to increase the kind of or decrease the polarization around human rights. It may dictate that you prioritize working on certain issues and not others. You know, um, if you you want to find a way to um, show that there can be common ground uh, and not just talk about it. You want to try to find issues where people can come together. And, and um, you know, it doesn't mean you limit yourself to places where there's, you know, kumbaya. But, um, and there's hardly any anyway. So, but you got to create that spirit. Uh, so, I think that we've made some progress there. Uh, and, um, you know, and I think that the, the recommendations definitely change over time depending on, you know, I talked about making sure your victories stay won. You know, uh, September 11th and the national reaction to September 11th changed a lot of things. And, you know, in some ways, I was on my way back from Durban, South Africa, from the UN Anti-Racism Conference on September 10th. And so... Uh, Many horrible things happened at that UN meeting. Um, it was, in some ways, a, an explosion of, of uh, racism and um, anti-Semitism in particular. And you know, on the flight back from South Africa, I was thinking, "Wow, you know, we have a lot of work to do to repair the damage that happened at this meeting." Um, you know, and uh, my brain was already working on how we could do that. And and then the next day you know, we were handed a whole new set of priorities. And, and when I reflect back on, you know, what um, changed over that time, I feel like, you know, we were looking to put, before that, we were looking to push the envelope in a lot of things. And, and then for 10 years, we were really fighting a kind of to regain ground that we thought was pretty, you know, pretty well won. Um, you know, the prohibition against torture in particular is so fundamental. And yet, you know, the country who had led the world in creating these standards was questioning them and uh, providing arguments to dictators around the world for how you could get around them. So in that sense, you know, it was a big step backward and we had to focus a lot on that, particularly those of us who care about American global leadership. You know, I personally, I love this country so much and I think that, you know, that I, I think you have to love your country before it can totally break your heart. Um, and that meant that, you know, we had to reorient ourselves to do more um, shoring up of what we thought was, was already won. Anybody else? Yes?
Yeah, we work very, very closely with all those organizations and many more. Um, you know, in Washington in particular, you know, everything gets done by coalition and no organization can achieve any real change by itself. Um, so we have very close working relationships with all those organizations. They're usually, you know, there's a working group around an issue, you know, so whether it's around asylum uh, law and refugee protection or around Guantanamo, the military commissions, um, you know, there are separate working groups. All those organizations are, are you know, play roles in those, uh, in those groups. And, and because, um, you know, the best coalitions are those where everybody brings something different to the table and understands the role they play in the overall um, uh, debate. Uh, you know, and, and so uh, I, I think we're blessed with very strong civil society groups that, you know, play different roles. Um, you know, whether it's bringing lawsuits, that's not what Human Rights First does, but sometimes it's very helpful um, to have those, uh, you know, trying to push these issues through the courts. Um, uh, you know, in the previous administration, you know, the courts were asleep for a long time, and um, it wasn't until they woke up that things really started to change. Um, so, uh, so we collaborate very closely, and I'm in touch myself a lot with my colleagues in other organizations, whether it's Human Rights Watch or Amnesty or CCR or the ACLU or a whole range of refugee groups. We lead a coalition on refugee protection in Washington, um, and uh, and we bring different things. So, so for example, on the on on the tour, and we try not to duplicate efforts is the other thing because you know there's so much work to do, and you really um, it can be tricky because in the nonprofit world you're sometimes competing for public recognition, you're competing for funding, um, and you know f smart funders tend to understand that nothing you know no one group is going to accomplish anything by themselves, and so they try to fund a strategy that requires groups to come together. But it is tricky, and we don't always agree on strategy, you know, and we have fights about it, um, which I think is healthy. And we don't control each other, so sometimes other groups make decisions that I think really set us back. Um, but we have open communication, and we talk about it, and, and vice versa. I mean, they definitely have issues with some of the decisions that I've made at Human Rights First, but we have very open um, conversations about it. I think it's very healthy, uh, and um, it's made us stronger. And, you know, I do a lot of work with um, civil society groups in other countries. And, you know, before 9-11 and all of that, I really spent most of my career working on the human rights um, uh, performance of other governments, not the United States. Uh, and, you know, most other uh, uh, civil society uh, groups in other countries really, um, they want to come here and learn from how we work together. Um, even when we're fighting, I, I think it's... A, a very healthy tension that we have, um, and a lot of smart people in the movement, so we're blessed by that. Anybody else? Yes. So what are the strategies that you have for advocacy for human rights in other countries? Are there any of those strategies that you try to use in your own movement to try to continue to advocate for the people that you're fighting with in other countries? Like, for instance, the In my, my job as the president of the organization, so that's a lo I spend a lot more of my time on that now, is thinking about priorities. How do we choose what issues we're going to uh, tackle and what strategies we're going to pursue? And those things are related. If you know yourself well and your strengths as an organization, then you know, um, you're looking for problems that are amenable to your strengths. And so if there's a problem where the real solution is there needs to be, you know, a, a class action a lawsuit um, pursued and won, uh, and that's what's going to turn things around, that's not going to be us. So, you know, there might be some things we could do to support that as part of a coalition, but we wouldn't be the ones pursuing that. So part of it is figuring out, um, you know, if you've got um, an objective, for, for, you know, you look at what, your, what are your assets, what would you bring to the table? What kind of coalition would you have to put together? Um, you know, for us, for example, um, you know, on the when we were um, trying to uh, trying to get a change made about interrogation policy, you know, the um, 
and get the CIA uh, secret prisons shut down. Um, you know, we a lot of the debate was about. Um, you know, the, the assertion was that, that torture was necessary, that it produced actionable intelligence, and that without it, Americans would be, um, would be not safe. Uh, and, you know, we didn't know anything about what, inter you know, interrogation policy, what, what worked, what didn't, you know, what the science was behind it. We didn't know anything about that. Um, and nobody else in our community did either, and there were a lot of people, you know, expressing outrage about when the Abu Ghraib photos came out and all of that, but we thought, you know, this is going back to my a advocacy strategies, you know, y y y ask questions and understand, seek to understand, and so we did. We pulled together um, a bunch of uh, senior military people and former interrogators, and we asked them to talk to each other about it and let us listen. Um, you know, we convened them around a table, and then we sat on outside, on the outside along the wall, and and asked somebody to just you know get them talking about it, and we listened, and it, it turned out that you know they had better arguments than we did for why this was uh, why this was wrong, why it was uh, risky for our you know military, um, and why it was counterproductive from a national security perspective. So we were able to develop that relationship that other organizations weren't able to, partly because of our organizational character, listening, you know, not so strident, but also because we, um, you know, we, we took the initiative to reach out to them, and they became a huge asset that helped change the nature of the debate. The other organizations, all uh, human rights organizations in the United States were working on this issue during that time because everybody knew it was really important to win. Um, but they all understood that that was an asset that we brought to the table, and and they you know helped us look for opportunities where that would be you know most impactful. So we worked together on that, even though we had a very unique approach to it. It was part of an overall strategy as much as possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I will just reiterate because it's worth reiterating that. Um, um, I'm kind of in, um, broken record with my own staff about how you how you choose objectives. Well, you know, one of the things is that you really have to articulate very clearly what your objective is out in the world, and it's got to be something that you know, you you know, you'll know when you succeed, not some vague thing like you know, make the world a better place or end torture for all time or you know that kind of thing. Know what you want, and then the strategy comes after that. Um, and uh, then you'll see who do you need to work with, who do you need to persuade, what do you need to learn, um, and uh, how are you going to know when you when you've won. So, anyway, I think that's uh, all we have time for right now. But um, I'm happy to talk. I'm going to stick around for probably another hour and just talk with whoever wants to because I can't get enough of this um, before I head out to New York. But it's really been such a pleasure to be here in this wonderful community. Uh, of learners and activists for several days, and I really, you know, I go back and forth between Washington and New York all the time, and I always say, oh, there's Philadelphia, <laughs> and uh, I just um, hope I get to stop uh, and get off the train more often, so thank you all very much.